Mr. Danny Diane, Chairman of Yad Vashem, Mr. Louis Shrensky, Yad Vashem supporter, Ms. Judy King, Helga Wolfenstein King's daughter, Ms. Eliad Maria Rosenberg, Curator and Director of the Art Department, Museums Division. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening from Jerusalem to our local audience here in Israel, and good morning to our audience in the United States. We have gathered virtually for the opening of a new display in the Museum of Holocaust Art at Yad Vashem, marking International Women's Day, entitled Helga Wolfenstein King, Creativity, Life, Creativity, and Love in Tourism. My name is Dodi Tolchin, and I work in the Yad Vashem Art Department. I'm pleased to be with you today on International Women's Day to celebrate the art of Helga Wolfenstein King and the opening of a special display at the Yad Vashem Art Museum. In 2019, thanks to the generosity of Barbara and Louis Shrensky, the Yad Vashem Art Museum acquired a collection of some 140 works of art made between 1942 and 1945 in the Terezin Ghetto. The majority of these artworks were made by the young artist, Helga Wolfenstein. At the end of 1941, when Helga was just 19 years old, she was deported to Terezin. She developed her artistic talent with help from instructors in the ghetto's drafting department, including artist and poet Peter Keen. Her sketches and small paintings give us a glimpse into the daily life at the Terezin ghetto. The new exhibit, Helga Wolfenstein King, Life, Creativity, and Love in Terezin, displays these works to the public for the first time. It's now my pleasure to introduce the chairman of Yad Vashem, Mr. Dani Dayan. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, obviously celebrating uh, International uh, Women's Day, uh, but also celebrating our uh, art museum, the Holocaust Art Museum. I believe that the, the Holocaust Art Museum is really one of the jewels, jewels in the crown of Yad Vashem. I can't imagine uh, a visit to Yad Vashem I can't imagine, I would say more than that, I can't imagine getting the full perspective and the full feeling of uh, remembering the Holocaust without uh, seeing the art of uh, Bruno Schulz, of Felix Nutzbaum, of Carl Deutsch, of Charlotte Salomon, which uh, uh, are also in our museum, uh, thanks to the generosity of Barbara and Louis Shrensky. I think that is uh, an integral part, more than integral part, is an essential part in uh, uh, the experience of Holocaust remembrance that uh, Yad Vashem strives to uh, give its visitors. Um, I remember my first day in uh, Yad Vashem as chairman. It was last August, and uh, I toured the campus for the first, of Yad Vashem for the first time as uh, chairman. And I obviously visited the Museum of Holocaust Art. And at the exit, uh, I saw the quote engraved in one of the walls the quote by Gela Zakstein. Gela Zakstein, a Polish Jewish painter. Um, her paint, her, her art survived the, thanks to the Ringenblum archive that was hidden inside huge milk cans. And I remember that quote, I, I saw that quote that says as a standard written in, in the ghetto in August 1st, 1942, in the Warsaw Ghetto. And she wrote that I stand on the border between life and death, certain that I will not remain alive, meaning I am, I know, she knew that she's doomed. I wish to take leave from my friends and my works. Mm -hmm. And here does comes the sentence that uh, really made me cry. My works I bequeath to the Jewish Museum to be built after the war. Gela Zeckstein knew in the hell of the Warsaw Ghetto, knowing that she will not survive, 
She knew that the Jewish people will stand to the commitment and uh, establish Yad Vashem. And inside Yad Vashem, it will establish, the Jewish people will establish an art museum to remember the art that was done under the most horrific circumstances you can imagine. Um, that is an additional reason why I believe that uh, our art museum is so important. That quote but by Gela Zakshen, that was my first decision as chairman of Yad Vashem, is today uh, in one of my wall, in one of the walls in my office. I knew that uh, that quote by Gela Zakshen uh, is what I want to see every morning when I come to Yad Vashem to help me not forget the responsibility that we all have. Responsibility towards the future and the present, but no less than that responsibility towards the victims. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, Barbara and Louis uh, for uh, allowing us to add uh, the Wolfenstein uh, collection to, to our art museum. Um, it, uh, it is uh, exceptional art done uh, by a, very, by a very, very young artist in Terezin, a place that in spite of the effort by the Nazis to present it, present it as a different place, a good place, uh, was hell on earth. And uh, it always amazed me, amazes me that the, the, the ability of artists, Jewish artists like Helga, in the ebb of human suffering and the worst conditions you can imagine, to prevail and create art. Uh, this is one more of the enigmas of uh, the Holocaust, of the Shoah, that we as persons that uh, were lucky enough not to endure such uh, circumstances probably will never understand. Thank you so much uh, to uh, you, uh, Barbara and Louis, to you, Judy, for being uh, with us, uh, to your late mother for giving us the giving humanity and the Jewish people and Yad Vashem this uh, treasure. Uh, to Eliad uh, More, our uh, curator, uh, that uh, I am always say very proudly that she was selected, selected as the culture manager of Europe for 2021. And uh, to all of you that are here with us, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Barbara and Louis Sherensky have been longtime supporters of Yad Vashem. Around 20 years ago, when the new museum complex was still under construction, Barbara and Louis Sherensky helped us acquire paintings by Charlotte Salomon, some of which are still part of the, of the permanent display at the Art Museum. Throughout the years, we have been able to count on their ongoing support and have significantly enriched, enriched the Yad Vashem art collection thanks to their generosity. It is an honor to invite Mr. Louis Shrensky from Maryland as a representative of the Shrensky family for a few words. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a distinct pleasure um, to represent the family, to be able to uh, join you on this very important occasion. Uh, you know, uh, we're living once again in a time of rising anti-Semitism uh, throughout the world and the role of Yad Vashem in educating others in Holocaust remembrance is ever more critical at this time. And teaching about the Holocaust is always uh, a, a important because we have to remember that uh, this is something that can never happen again. And uh, this teaching by, by the Yad Vashem makes it a fact beyond denial. And it's so important that we continue to make this, this teaching go on and on and on. We all recognize that with each passing year, future survivors 
uh, remain, uh, future survivors are, are not available to us and, and their memories are not, are not available to be shared with us. So, so we, we, look to, we look to their, their testimonies, their audio, their video and their written testimonies to, to tell us what, what happened. How wonderful it is to supplement these testimonies with the art, with the art that was made during these most horrific times, and 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 so uh, along along with the the art that was made at those times, we look to the artists who lived during those difficult times, and the beauty that they 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 look for when they lived during that then those times, the the beauty they they look for. And they and the, they also reached for the the memories of of their past to bring that out at the same time. And we see this in the art. We see this in the art of the beautiful collection of the Helga Wolfenstein King collection, and the art that she brought brought, brought together. This collection includes the work also of Peter Keen, and we have the opportunity to meet Helga Wolfenstein King, and join her and Peter King and their experiences in Theresen. By standing before the original art works of these artists, we have the opportunity to connect to their very personal and individual experiences that they were documenting for future generations. You see the original hand of these artists and maybe even feel the soul of the artist. The Helga Wolverstein King Collection is powerful in its unique character of sharing what happened during the Holocaust. It's important, therefore, to bring this collection to rest alongside other primary artworks of this period at the most prestigious Holocaust art museum in the world. And my family is very pleased to be able to participate in this effort. We too gain enormous satisfaction that the Yad Vashem Art Museum continues to acquire the finest collections of Holocaust art. I know the collection we are dedicating today is very welcome and appreciated at its new home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shransky. You're very welcome. Ms. Eliad Moret Rosenberg, curator and director of the Yad Vashem Art Department, will now give a presentation on the life of Ms. Helga Wolfenstein King. Shalom. I am very pleased to be here with you today for the virtual opening of a tangible exhibition in the Art Museum. Before giving you a short presentation about the art and life of Helga Wolfenstein King, I would like to thank our special participants, Mr. Danny Dayan, our chairman. Thank you for your dedication to the Art Museum and for your meaningful words. I am grateful to Mrs. Barbara and Louis Shrensky for being longtime supporters of the Ad Vashem and in particular of the art collection. It is always a pleasure for me to talk art with you <laughs> and hear about your special collection. Uh, Mrs. Judy King, Helga Wolfenstein's King's daughter with whom I felt a true connection from the very start. You have always been a great help and shared so much information and knowledge with us. Thank you. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Mrs. Viviane Oria, our museum's division director, and Yifat Bachachron, her deputy, for their trust and support, making the acquisition of this important collection and its display possible. I'm grateful to the following divisions and departments of Yad Vashem for their significant contributions, international relations, media relations, commemoration and public relations, information technology uh, division, graphic design and production, the archives, and my colleagues from the museum's division, conservation section, and the artifacts department. Last but not least, 
My thanks go to the team of the art department who worked with me on every part connected to, connected to this exhibition. Orly Ohana, Michal Feiner Rosenthal, Liat Schieber, Liat Daisy, and of course, Dodi Tolsi. And now let's talk art. So I'll share my presentation, and let we go. Uh, so from the beginning. Uh, so as an introduction, I would like to start with a story, a special booklet uh, written and illustrated by uh, Helga Wolfenstein King in Theresienstadt during 1942 and 1943. You see, it's so small, so tiny, it's just four inches. Um, and it tells the story, it's a popular story, about two frogs that fell into a bucket of cream. Um, one frog uh, just was in complete despair and sank. The other one uh, started swimming, trying to survive at all costs. And in the end, after swimming so much, uh, the cream solidified into butter and the frog was able uh, to, to go out, to jump out. And uh, the frog took with, um, with her uh, the other frog and, and saved her. And we see it ends, so it's a happy end, as you see on the flag with the Star of David. And you see also um, a red star of David on this nurse's cap. And this um, probably most obviously, uh, this, um, st this frog stands for, for uh, Helga's mother, Hermina, who was the um, uh, head, the matron of, uh, of the, um, uh, inf the infectious diseases ward. And, um, and, and she was very strong and helped everyone around her. Now let's see who are uh, the characters, the real characters in real life. Uh, so you can see Helga Wolfenstein King, 18 years old. And then you can see just before the war, uh, Helga and her mother, Hermina, uh, and um, the, her, I mean, the other, the other sister, Renata, uh, who just got married before uh, the war and was able to uh, reach England with her husband. And thus, uh, they were spared uh, these difficult years in Czechoslovakia. Uh, Helga was born in Brno. Uh, and her father, at, um, when she was quite young, uh, left. Uh, the family and re re remarried. And so um, Hermina, who was a teacher, um, was used already to, 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 to be a strong uh, woman. And, and she was a source of inspiration for everyone when they came uh, to Terezin because uh, she's the one who uh, was very active and dynamic um, and, and um, helped everyone. Uh, now you see here uh, the, the um, transport card. It's from it's the transport card of Helga Wolfenstein. Uh, you can see, so she comes from you know, her, her hometown. Uh, she arrives really uh, with the first transport, first transports to uh, Theresienstadt. Uh, so she arrived on um, uh, December uh, 2, uh, 1941. Her number is 682 and transport G. And uh, when she arrives, she's just 19 years old. And here you have this 19 years old uh, girl who arrives to Riesenstadt. And look at this uh, painting, this watercolor. Uh, that she painted a few months later, 
Uh, it shows, it gives us a bit of the claustrophobic feeling uh, when head, when entering, when arriving into Reisenstadt. Well, of course, it's a place that was designed as a fortress town uh, in the 18th century. Uh, but uh, through this composition, with this choice, um, Helga gives us this a really sense of arriving to a dead end. And what strikes us is that in spite of this situation, well, this young woman finds herself in, in a prison, in a camp, in a ghetto. It's a camp that is, it's a ghetto that has characteristics of a concentration camp and serves as a transit camp for um, uh, Jews um, uh, to the extermination camps. So in this place, she chooses art and she chooses life uh, and, and she chooses life through art. And this is what we'll try to see in this uh, short presentation. Um, here you can see her, her room, the room she shares with uh, her mother and her aunt. Uh, maybe I forgot to mention she arrived with an aunt by the name of Uli. Uh, Julia a Fleischer, and um, so they share uh, uh, this room with other uh, persons. Um, and um, and look at these two um, uh, watercolors. Uh, we can see what happens within just a few months, three months. Um, separate these two watercolors. The first uh, we can see how. Um, Helga is meticulous in all the details she gives us. And de these details uh, are very interesting for us to learn about how they organize their lives there. Uh, for instance, you can see how they, uh, how the clothes are hanging and oh, we, we definitely see the uh, Jewish badges on, on the clothing. And we see how with the, the little they had, they organized themselves, for instance, uh, using their suitcases. So the first suitcase uh, belongs to uh, Helga's mother, Hermine. The second suitcase belongs to Helga because it's their number of transport. Um, the bucket that we see here belongs to Hermina. And um, these, um, also the use of color here, it's almost optimistic. At the beginning, they come with, you know, this maybe energy, they, they try to make the best out of, of what they have. And um, we still, uh, we see how they, um, uh, really a struggle to maintain uh, normalcy. Uh, three months later, already we see that the conditions have deteriorated, they are sleeping on banks. And uh, what we also see is that in just three months, the style, the artistic style of Helga has changed from um, maybe a more naive, uh, approach, a very colorful approach, uh, looking into every kind of detail. And uh, now she is, um, she, she, she has become more expressive um, and, um, and, and, and shows maturity in her style. Um, so as I mentioned, as we saw um, with the frog, uh, um, Hermine, Helga's mother uh, was appointed um, as the chief or the matron uh, of the um, uh, ward for infectious uh, diseases. And we can learn about her strong personality from the two caricatures that we see. The first caricature here in the middle uh, was done as a birthday card by Helga Wolfenstein. Uh, and she, it was given to her mother. Uh, and you can see how she admonishes Dr. Polak. So you see uh, roles are reversed and she is like this strong, very, very uh, powerful uh, woman. It's very, I think, appropriate to mention um, 
Hermine's memory today when we are celebrating um, women all around the world. Um, so, so we can learn about her strong personality. She's really afraid uh, from her, apparently. And you, we can see another uh, caricature that was done by Bedrich Spreta, um, an artist um, active in Terezin, uh, who um, depicts um, uh, Hermine with a whip in, in one hand and a gun in the other. And uh, we see all the um, uh, girls that uh, suffer from encep encephalitis, which is a disease, uh, uh, an, an infection, inflammation of the brain tissues. Um, and that, that leads to all kinds of, of um, uh, symptoms, very difficult uh, hallucinations and all other um, symptoms that are portrayed in these women. So we see how strong she is um, with the patient, uh, probably with uh, the, the, the medical, um, all the medical um, uh, staff. Um, and um, Helga herself uh, was able to find a work um, within the technical department in the Zeitschnungsbüro, which is the drafting office. And uh, probably it was with the help of her mother who knew about her artistic talent. So we can see Helga here in the middle who is uh, working with her um, friends from the technical department. And one of the artists working there is Dieter Kinn. Um, now the technical, just a few words about the technical department. Here we see um, works that were done in uh, the technical department. Uh, for instance, this poster done uh, by Peter Kinn uh, and you see how his sketches, his studies helped him in order to uh, create this poster. And uh, so the role of the technical department was to provide um, the Jewish council uh, with reports, with all kinds of brochure, statistics, um, posters for their needs. Uh, and it also served for propaganda um, uh, um, purposes. Um, now, it is worth mentioning that people, uh, the people, the artists working in the technical department during their free time, uh, because they had access to painting materials, they, in clandestinity, they portrayed real life, what was really going on in the ghetto. And thanks to their um, depictions, we know a great deal about what the real Theresienstadt and not the one that the Nazis wanted uh, to show the world. Uh, and especially uh, the Red Cross, you know, then from uh, the end of 1943, um, the Theresienstadt ghetto was used by the Germans to serve as a um, ghetto, as a model or, or in order for propaganda reasons. And they wanted to have uh, the commissions of the Red Cross come to Theresienstadt. Now, everything was a lie, of course. And uh, in order to present the ghetto, uh, they, um, they, they deported massively the people from tourism stuff. So here, thanks to the artists that took great risk, risks in order to depict the reality of tourism stuff, we know what life was really like. And here I chose uh, three uh, paintings dealing with death, uh, the omnipresent uh, uh, death that was in Theresienstadt. So, for instance, the hearses that were used not just uh, to uh, transport uh, bodies, uh, but also um, 
for for every other possible use for 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 uh, for instance to transport food and supplies and also the elderly who weren't able to walk uh, but this image of the hearse in Theresienstadt, which was the only vehicle that was allowed, so it's the vehicle from the Hebra Kadisha, the funerary um, uh, vehicle, it is uh, a symbol, it stands as a symbol of, uh, of death and, and the terrible conditions in Theresienstadt. Um, just from the, the very uh, dreadful conditions of this place, 35,000 people died just of malnutrition, um, this uh, crowdedness, um, not having access to um, hygienic, normal hygienic uh, conditions. Um, and of course, death was always present because there were all the time uh, these transports to the east to the extermination camps and people in Theresienstadt lived constantly under the fear of the next uh, transport, of being included on the next transport to the East. Um, and uh, um, 88,000 people were deported from, from Theresienstadt uh, to the extermination camps, mostly Auschwitz, but also some others. And uh, so, you know, we have to remember that when um, we talk about Theresienstadt, because sometimes uh, it is being remembered just as the model ghetto, and it doesn't really uh, depict the reality of the place. Uh, Helga, as well, um, depicted uh, this harsh reality and you can see how she tells about how it was like living in this place and how they um, suffered from the very uh, difficult conditions there. Um, here, uh, okay, now in this situation, in she meets uh, Peter King. So, as I said, Peter King, uh, no, maybe I didn't say so <laughs> already, I'll say it just now. Um, Peter King was also working in the technical department. Actually, he was uh, the deputy um, director of the, of the, sorry, of the drafting um, office. Of, in the technical department. So he was, yeah, he was the deputy manager of the um, drawing office. And, and um, he was also originally from Brno. So, uh, well, he wasn't born there, but he was born in Bansdorf, but he was um, living in Brno. And so he and Helga and had immediately a very strong uh, connection. They shared a passion for art. Now, uh, Peter King had been already um, an active uh, painter uh, at the beginning of his career in Prague. He had learned at the uh, Prague Academy of Fine Arts, and he also taught there. Uh, so he came uh, as an experienced um, artist and that's why he was probably chosen to be the deputy uh, director of the drawing office and um, he was also a poet and he also wrote uh, poetry and um, plays and he's mostly known for the for writing the libretto of the emperor of atlantis um, now, Helga recalls um, how they first, um, how their connection really started, uh, how, how this great friendship started. It was when he uh, invited her to join him uh, to be his assistant in, one, in uh, painting outside. 
And uh, in these two paintings, we can see um, really the symbiosis that happens between the two um, because Peter King is painting, and this is how uh, Helga depicted him. And she herself was painting at the same spot, um, at probably at the same occasion. So a lot we'll see how they worked together. Uh, and she remembers, Peter, Peter and I started a great friendship. We were together for eight hours at the drawing office and for an hour or two afterwards, sitting next to one another, drawing and painting. Peter was teaching me, lending me books to read, and I admired him. So now we'll see a series of, of works that each time we have the two uh, views. We have Helga's look and we have um, uh, Peter Keane's look on the same subject. Subject. So we see a lot of common subject matters because they are working together and we learn a lot about life, cultural activity, also in Theresienstadt. And she said that in our sad and deprived circumstances, we found a deep joy in one another's company and we hated to be separated even for the short hours of sleep. Um, this um, Lange Straße um, spot, specific uh, place, was uh, very significant for them. Peter Kinn and his wife, um, Ilse Stranska, uh, where uh, their names were um, on, on the transport on October 1944. Actually, their parents, um, both of Ilse Stranska and of Peter Kinn, also uh, were uh, on on the Oct October uh, transports, and um, they, they were uh, sent to Auschwitz, and no one from the family uh, survived. Uh, but before being deported, Peter Kinn gave a suitcase, a present to Helga. Let's see how... Um, Helga remembers. Peter decided to make me a present of a suitcase with his drawings. It was a special acid-free suitcase. It was his idea that mother could hide it at the infection department where German visits or searchers were unlikely. Peter told me to sell some of the innocent landscapes if I was in need. I was in chronic need even after the war, but I never sold anything. I think this quote well illustrates um, the love that um, Helga had for uh, Peter and how these drawings were meaningful for her uh, throughout her life. After uh, the war, at liberation, um, Hermine, Helga's mother, died just one day after liberation. She died of typhus, and Helga could not even say goodbye. So from the whole family, only Helga and her aunt, Uli, uh, survived. And uh, Helga decided to start a new life in Prague. She became an, uh, a graphic designer and uh, later on moved um, to live next to her sister who was in London, Renata, remember from the beginning. And, um, and there uh, she, she met with a, with a friend originally also from Brno, but who had become an American citizen and um, they, uh, so this was Mr. Wolfenstein, and they um, married and settled in Florida in the United States. And this is where uh, Judy, their first 
um, and their only child uh, was born. And um, so, and, and I have to say that Helga continued to be active artistically. And um, I think that now you better understand why I started uh, this presentation with the story of the two frogs, because I think uh, it illustrates not only Hermine's survival, but also Helga's survival uh, in Theresienstadt. It is this optimistic frog uh, who does everything uh, in her power in order to stay alive. This is the story also of Helga King, uh, who, in spite of being imprisoned at the age of 19 uh, in Theresienstadt, chose life and chose art uh, in order uh, to stay alive. And, um, and I think that for us, she's really a source of inspiration and it is important to remember her and her family today um, when we celebrate women uh, all around the world. Thank you, Eliad. We will now play a short video, giving us a peek at the exhibition currently on display at the Yad Vashem Art Museum. The video is accompanied by music written by Gideon Klein. Klein was born in the Pharaoh of Moravia in 1919. He studied music in Prague and the Kaga Wolfenstein. He was deported to the Theresien Ghetto in December 1941. Klein died in Grubach concentration camp in January 1945. The music chosen for this video is part of a piece called Trio, which Klein composed in 1944, while both he and Helga were incarcerated in the Theresien Ghetto. We now have the honor of hearing firsthand about Helga Wolfenstein King from the artist's only child, Miss Judy King, a gifted photographer. Miss King is joining us from Pompano Beach, Florida, and will answer some of our questions. Hello, Judy. <laughs> Hi, Eliad. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, how was it like growing with a mother who was a Holocaust survivor and an artist? Well, 
it feels as if I always knew about mother being a concentration camp survivor. But I realized in retrospect that as I got older, the camp stories became more detailed. She told me about her camp experiences. And I learned that mother was 19 when she entered Theresienstadt concentration camp that the Czechs called Terezin. That as you had said, the Nazis created a ghetto of Jewish artists, poets, playwrights, actors, and musicians at Terezin. And their motivation was to trick the Red Cross into believing it was just a fenced artist colony rather than a forced labor camp with deprivation, disease, and death. Mother always seemed to be driven to create art and crafts. Aside from watercolor and acrylic painting and, and charcoal, sanguine lead, pe pastel, pen and ink drawings, she made collages, mosaics, pottery, copper enamel quilts. She knitted and crocheted. She uh, made parasols, lash hook rugs, artificial flowers, costume jewelry, and clothes. And my father was a maitre d'hotel. And so she made daddy a tuxedo and she made mother herself and me mother daughter dresses. And she made our outfits for my Barbie dolls. And she transmitted her love of visual art to me. She gave me art supplies and she taught me how to use them. She talked to me about artists and, and uh, it gave me some of the vocabulary of art, and we looked at books and magazines together, and we discussed art and fashion, and we had many memorable outings to a variety of art venues and events. And But I have to say that when I was a girl, mother's art intimidated me, and I didn't want to work in any areas that were mother's strengths. But as a woman, I'm a photographer largely because of mother's influence. In the 1960s, the Germany offered reparation money to inmates who met psychiatric criteria. And mother wanted to build a studio onto our house with some of the money, but daddy prevailed. And this meant that mother was creating most of her contemporary art in our living room and dining room. So each day before school, I would see mother's latest art project on her easel. And after school, I would see how the project had progressed. And sometimes there would be images of Peter Keen on her easel. And that was because she would incorporate these Holocaust images in her contemporary view of, of Holocaust themes. And I was so impressed that that daddy showed no signs of jealousy about mother's continuing fixation on Peter Keen. I, I really don't think I could have done that. Did she, did she tell you about Peter Keen? What place had Peter Keen in your life? Yes, Peter, uh, mother told me about how her uh, efficient mother, Mina, had hair Mina, short Mina, became the matron of the infectious disease ward at Terezin. And they, they lived there with Mina's sisters and several nurses in the nurse's barrack. When you saw the little watercolor of their room, that was the nurse's garments on the walls with, that they shared. And although mother was a draftswoman in Terezin, sometimes she worked in the fields and she smuggled carrots in her clothes for her roommates. And she could have died of the typhus and typhoid fever and bacteria she contracted as an inmate. But uh, she, she was a talented young artist, poet, linguist. And she met Peter Keen, who was also a little older than she was, but a talented artist, poet, and libretto writer of, of operas. And their common interests and temperaments drew them together. And, and they fell in love in the drafting department, as Eliad said. And sometimes they would go on art dates and paint landscapes side by side. On one of their dates, mother lost a glove. And so this was 
yet gloves were in very short supply. So at, at, at sunrise, she hurried out there to retrieve her glove as she found Peter there had already retrieved it and, and was showing it to her. And they, they wrote each other love notes in a little code that they had for each other. So uh, it, love made the stress and suffering of camp bearable for them. And then Terezin artists, Peter Keen, Otto Ungar, Joe Speer, and my mother hid their Holocaust artworks in a suitcase that uh, was in grandmother Mina's infectious disease ward because no Nazi in his right mind would set foot in that room. They didn't want the diseases that the inmates had. So the suitcase was relatively safe there. And as Eliad said, Peter told mother that if he died and she and the artwork survived, she should sell them in order to survive herself. But she could never bring herself to doing that even when she was 22 years old and orphaned from the camps at, on Liberation Day. And then her not approving of mother's relationship with Peter Keene, Nina uh, didn't, uh, didn't know that Auschwitz was a death camp and she was delighted that they were going to be deported to Auschwitz. It, it seems incredible to hear that today, but. She didn't know and she just wanted to break them up. But the evening before they were to leave for Auschwitz, Peter Keene spent the entire night awake trying to convince the guards to keep mother and Mina off the transport. And when morning came and he was sure that mother and Mina were not going to be deported, he fainted from worry and effort and exhaustion and malnourishment. Tragically, as Eliad said, Peter was ultimately deported to Auschwitz himself where he perished. In 2001, German Holocaust author Jürgen Zürke came to America to interview my mother for his, che his Czech book, Vermische Dörfer. And I have that book here. He wrote extensively about Peter Keen at Mother's Love Story and the fact that the suitcase of Holocaust artworks was being held at the Terezin Memorial and Ghetto Museum, despite Helga's legal case to regain it. So this is, this is the Czech version of the book. There is a German version of the book, but mother isn't in the, oh, is it too high or low? I'm sorry, <laughs> let, me, let me see, here we go, yes, so, right. and, so uh, that, that book kind of chronicles uh, their lives together there. And I think I covered what you wanted to know. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, this is really, truly fascinating. Each time we talk, I learn something new. <laughs> so um, now maybe I, I would like to, to ask you, uh, Judy, um, I think I've become acquainted with your mother's work through the website that you created um, in her memory. And I want to ask you, uh, as the second generation, as the, you know, the one bearing now the testimony of your mother, uh, what it means for you and how you became so much involved if you could share with us. Right, so in, in, tw in 2012, I, I decided I wanted to mount a posthumous show for my mother, and it was called The Art of Survival. So um, this, is, this is the poster from the show. It, I, I guess maybe it's backwards for you, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I needed to get her materials cataloged for it because I wanted to show a PowerPoint video in the background. And so I photographed everything. I, I had friends like my cousin Peter in London and, and, uh, and, and other friends who spoke Czech to translate some of the Czech and German because I have very rudimentary knowledge of both of those languages. And so I put translations on the website called helgaking.com. 
and, and 400 of her 600 artworks are on there. I ran out of steam. I just couldn't get myself to do the other 200 pieces, but they were, they were there. And, uh, uh, and then I talked with Randy Schoenberg and he was the American attorney who was featured in the movie, The Woman in Gold about the retrieval of artworks from Austria. And I talked with him about the retrieval of the suitcase that still exists intact. Um, and, and he said, well, there are a few issues. One is that your mother had an unsuccessful legal case in the Czech court system. And so they, they will probably not want to hear the case again unless there's new evidence. And the other is that they, um, I'm sorry, I had a little lapse in memory. I, I can't remember what I was going to say, but uh, uh, yeah, she, he said that the Czech Republic is much more difficult to, to get artwork out of than, than Austria was. So those were two difficulties. Um, maybe if you can more specifically address, uh, there's a question in uh, the chat about how did the suitcase with the artwork get to the museum? Maybe that's the link people did not uh, understand how from Peter King, uh, Peter giving it to your mother, how it reached uh, the museum. That's an excellent question. So what happened was on Liberation Day, mother took the suitcase and left Terezin with it. And, and her mother died right around Liberation Day. So she, mother was fully orphaned but her aunt Uli lived and mother needed to make a living. And so she was going to become a commercial artist in Prague. And she lived in a little garret apartment, had no room for the suitcase. So she gave it to aunt Uli to store and it was in the attic and it stayed there for decades. Even after mother left Czechoslovakia because she was afraid it would have been confiscated at the border. So she didn't dare leave Czechoslovakia with the suitcase. So fast forward, my aunt Lily hired, unbeknownst to her, a communist sympathizer who uh, reported that he had found this treasure trove of, of artworks in the attic in the suitcase. And he informed the communists that my aunt Uli had this, and they threatened to take her pension away uh, if she did not turn it over to them. And so she did, and she was heartbroken, and she wrote my mother these, these letters of great guilt and shame that she had had to part with it in order to survive. And so the Terezin Museum got the suitcase intact, and one would have thought that the artworks would be distributed all across the globe, but they weren't. They, they stayed in the suitcase. And Terezin recognizes that they are not the, the modern. Oh, yes, I forgot to say. So once communism fell, the Terezin Museum still had the suitcase. And they re recognized they're not the rightful owner, so they're not entitled to show the work but they are caregiving the work. And in 2017, I went to the Terezin Museum to ask them about what would it take for me to be declared the rightful owner and be able to export the work. And they, they said that they agree I am the rightful owner, but that I would need to go hire a Czech attorney, go through the Czech court system and, and get uh, declared the owner and get the right to export the work. Okay, I hope that uh, at some some point you will be able to to retrieve these works because I know how uh, dear they were to your mother and how important it was for her to uh, receive these works uh, back. Uh, so uh, thank you, Judy. And uh, you, uh, now um, let Dodi conclude. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, King. Uh, 
uh, for sharing these incredibly moving words with us. And we hope we're able to see you soon at Yad Vashem um, in person. <laughs> we invite you all to visit Yad Vashem and to see the original works discussed here today. For those unable to visit, we encourage you to take a look at the Yad Vashem Art Museum website, which now includes a page about Helga Wolfenstein King and Peter Kim. In addition, to mark International Women's Day, we've released a special online exhibit focusing on women artists from our collection. There, you can find information about Helga Wolfenstein King, as well as other talented women who created art despite the hardships of the Holocaust. The website links are available in the chat. Thank you for joining us on this International Women's Day. Thank you, Shania.